So um, both of you, it's best if you listen to your computer speakers. You can see the little uh, visual here. And remember to unmute your speakers when it's time to talk. If that's not working, you can listen by phone. Just be sure to select the telephone option on your control panel for further instructions. And then while we're all participating right now, everyone is going to be on mute. And if your computer has a built-in microphone or you're listening, at some point today we're going to do a little poll where I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. You can see the hand circled. And we'll be able to see your answer to the questions that we ask. And at different parts today, during the day, during the webinar, we're going to be able to stop and have questions for you. One last thing I want to show you is this little orange bar here that's circled. If for some reason your control panel gets minimized, just click that orange arrow and you can get it back. So let's just check in real quickly with um, making sure folks can hear me. If you don't have a microphone, I see one question about that. You can call in with your uh, phone as well. So it looks like folks are doing OK. All right. So as I said, hi, my name is Lee Hopheimer. Wish I could see your faces. And today we're going to really just talk about, we're going to narrow down the focus and talk about what it's like to use the screening tools around domestic violence, what are those conversations like, to the initial screening, what are some strategies to use to get those conversations going, and what are follow-up conversations could they be like, even if you get a yes, even if you get a no, nothing's happening, and some resources. And just to let you know a little bit about myself, if you haven't met me at one of the trainings, I've been doing this work in one form or another um, for the past almost 30 years, and I'm now at our Domestic Violence Coalition, but I have done direct service advocacy at our battered women's shelters and programs and worked on hotlines and worked in the courts. So I've had a, a range of experiences and heard a lot of stories, and I've had the pleasure for the past, what is it now, Jenny, three years? Mm -hmm. three, three years of working with the Department of Early Learning and meeting home visitors out in the field. And I really feel like home visitors and domestic and sexual violence advocates have so much in common. We have so many shared values. We're working in the community. We're often of the community. We're working from a strengths-based perspective. We're trying to listen to what people want and need for, their, for themselves and for their children. And so I'm really hoping that one of the things that comes out of this partnership is that you get to know your local domestic violence advocate, not just the program, not just the phone number, but that you all get to have lunch sometime or meet out in the community. and. Probably some of you have already been doing that. So one of the things I wanted to also thank you for is when you registered for this webinar, we asked you two questions. You know, we asked you what gets in, the, what comes up, or what what comes up when you're doing that, when you want to talk about domestic violence and use the screening tools for the first time, and then we asked you what issues come up when you want to talk about domestic violence and you want to follow up and have a follow up conversation about domestic violence or unhealthy relationships. So we pulled together that information. I tried to pull together the most common answers that you identified in two big categories, for the families that you work with and for you, the home visitor. And then we went a little further and worked on the themes. So the kind of the most common answers we saw for what comes up when you want to talk about domestic violence and use the screening tool for the first time, for the families you were working with, Many of you may see your answer reflected in this list here up on the slide. What, what people are worrying about what you're going to do with the information. People are just telling you no right away. People are just telling you what you want to hear. People are downplaying. People have fear. So these are the most kind of common answers that came up. And then for you, the first time you're initially using this call, using this screening tool, what we heard from you was, you know, your discomfort around using the tool, when's the right time, when's the best time to ask, awkwardness, lack of trust, that there may not be any adequate resources in your community to, to send people to anyway or to help people with. The partner is always around. So these were, these were the bulk of the answers that we heard from you. And it really informed kind of how we put together this talk today. So the themes that we saw 
in this first round of questions really kind of broke down and I feel like in the, we can use these categories in the, the biggest to capture the most of what you all were saying. So for the families that you're working with, there's a lot of worry around what happens, confidentiality, what happens to this information. There was a lot of concern around um, either needing a partner's permission, upsetting a partner, a lot of concern around can we, can we have an honest conversation? Is the family just going to tell me what I want to hear? And, you know, led to the question of, like, why should the person be honest with you? Is it to their advantage, their benefit? For you, the difficulty in using the tool. You don't want the family to know you're using a tool. Worry about losing a positive relationship or building trust. And wondering, like, what's really out there? And then when we looked at the when we combine the answers around what gets in the way for the follow-up conversations, you can see, again, a lot of commonality around um, some of the same questions that you all, some of the same answers that you all brought up, like not knowing how to effectively bring this topic back up. Is it your business? What are the words? What are the boundaries? What if the couple's back together? How do I do it safety, safely? What if the most pressing thing is what's going on with the child right now? Maybe there's medical issues, and how do I deal with that? And for the families, or the individual mom you might be working with, you know, what, what might be getting in the, in the way could be the relationship they've had in the past is worse than the relationship they're in right now. And there being a lot of fear about talking about it or not wanting to talk about it, this partner's always present. So you all had a lot of commonality around these answers. And the themes that came up, again, the two biggest, the the two, the, not just two, but the four biggest areas for both the families and you, I thought it was interesting that it really seemed like for both working with the family or the individual woman and you, there are two places where both categories popped up. Relationships, past and present, and limited resources. And so we're going to be talking about those things as we get through, go through this training today. And I think one thing that's an important to note when you think about all the issues that you're dealing with when once you start having this conversation around domestic violence, once you open that door, however you do it, I think one of the things that's really critical, and I think it makes a lot of sense for home visitors, is that the child safety is always linked to the non-abusive parent safety. So as we go through this conversation, even if you don't, even if you wished that parent was more forthcoming with you, even if you don't think you have all the information, even if you think they're minimizing or things that they're not talking about, things that they should be talking about. And I would even add they may be having grief and sadness about the relationship, that it's not going the way they hoped it would go, that we, there's research that backs up our common sense understanding that says the best way to protect the child is to make sure the non-abusive parent feels safe, listened to, and protected as well. Okay, so before we get right into using looking at the preferred screening tools that many of you, if you're receiving any federal McV dollars, um, are being asked to use, or maybe your program's even requiring you to use them. I thought we didn't know how many people might have joined this webinar who's, who've never been to any of the domestic violence assessment and response trainings that the Department of Early Learning and Thrive has been putting on. So it would be helpful just to share, have a little bit of shared um, language around what, what do we mean when we talk about domestic violence? So why is talking about domestic violence important? Well, besides the obvious things that we want people to be safe, cared for, we want them to have healthy relationships, is that it'll actually, if domestic violence is happening, it can actually undermine the goals of whatever work you're doing with people. And the other thing that's so great about talking about this subject is that when women talk to someone they trust, they're more likely to seek help. And it can be a really important piece of information to have about someone's life that you would need to understand to know what steps to take next and where to go next. And we'll talk about language. I don't think it's important or even relevant for people to label themselves as abuse victims or domestic violence victims, but it might be important for you to know that coercion, Emotional abuse, possibly physical abuse, is all going on in the background. So when we talk about domestic violence, we're not talking about a criminal legal definition of domestic violence. So if you looked it up in our Washington RCW, you would see a very different definition from what's here. This definition comes from 
talking with survivors and talking with people who, who have caused harm, frankly, over now probably like 40 years of work. I would say it's closer to probably like a public health definition. And what we've come to understand is that it's a pattern of behavior that one person uses to gain power and control over the other. And sometimes that involves physical violence, sometimes that involves rape, and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it, all it has to involve is the belief that something like that can happen to you. So there are all kinds of ways that people can maintain dominance in that relationship. The big difference is you can be in a really crappy relationship, but you're not afraid to say no to that person, nor do you suffer any real consequences if you do. So for instance, I've talked to women who've said, you know, I can deal with him hitting me. What I can't deal with is him taking my kids and being gone for three days and I don't know where they are. And so that threat of taking my children is what keeps me in this relationship. Or he has my paperwork, and I, he won't file my paperwork for my citizenship, or he threatens me with deportation if I choose to do anything. Or nobody in my family knows we're gay, and if I leave this relationship, my partner said, I'll tell your job, I'll tell your family. Try to get, keep, get your kids then, try to keep your kids then. So there are all kinds of ways to maintain power and control in a relationship, and they're going to be as unique as the people involved. And what you're listening for is that inability of someone to be able to have their decisions respected, to have their autonomy respected, um, to be able to do things without retaliation or out consequence, without consequence. And isolation is very common, so I don't want Anyone coming over here that I don't know exactly what's happening, I don't, your family doesn't like me, I don't like them, I don't want you hanging out with other people outside of our community, I don't want you talking to the home visitor unless I'm right there at her elbow, which can be tricky because that can be something that's happening as a, you feel like as a, a, the way that family works, that you just can't have that conversation. You just can't talk to the partner or the mom without the husband present. And it may be, it, there may be power and control and coercion going on, there may not be, but it's something that you have to learn to kind of listen differently and not just look for physical signs and symptoms. And so we're talking about behavior that's not illegal. It's not illegal to accompany somebody to every appointment they have and never let them speak for themselves. It's not illegal to stand beside somebody at, um, on the scale and weigh them and tell them, you need to lose weight, you're a fat pig. That's not illegal. It's not illegal to say to someone, you can go to the grocery store, but I want to see the receipt and you come back. And I want to see how much money you spent. And if you spent more money, you're in trouble. You know, those things are not illegal, but those things can be humiliating and can help, can help chip away at the autonomy somebody may have in the relationship. Okay. So we're really trying to listen for behavior that narrows the choices of the mom that you're working with and doesn't expand their choices. We're looking for things that are, behavior and tactics are happening that narrow their experience. And the other thing I just want to acknowledge for folks that are on the line is that we know that in heterosexual relationships we can have um, men who are also victims of domestic violence, and we know that also in same-gendered relationships people can be, uh, abuse can happen as well. But we're still, we're talking about tools that are built with pretty, the focus being on a woman and still um, primarily abuse is happening still up in the 80s with 80% um, early 90s around uh, the in heterosexual relationships, the woman being the, the person being targeted for harm. However, with one of the tools we were able to, and some of the tools I'm going to show you, we're able to have more gender neutral language like my partner instead of she or he, that can, that can give you some um, flexibility to move with the families that you're dealing with and working with. Okay, so what could some of this look like specifically in terms of undermining the parent-child or mother-child relationship? So here are just some examples, but what we have really heard from women is that sabotaging her parental authority and her relationship is an effective way to maintain dominance in the relationship. And especially like once you get past the infants or you have children who are able to talk, using children to monitor behavior, who she's talking to, what is she saying, where she, who she's seeing, who's coming to the house. But you can see even with infants interfering with breastfeeding, 
why might that happen? Well, you're, you all can probably imagine some of the reasons why that might happen, but, you know, um, I'm supposed to be able to have sexual relations with you whenever I want, breastfeeding is getting in the way, you know, um, it's making things uncomfortable and messy, um, I want you to be focused on me. So you can just see through these examples where the mother-child or parent-child relationship can be sabotaged and undermined and can help the other person maintain dominance in the relationship and keep that person focused on their partner's reactions. So, you know, even this one around restricting mom's time, she doesn't get time to relax or get to know their infant as well because she's worried about meeting all the demands of keeping the household a specific way that their partner wants when they're not present or placating their partner and trying to keep things as calm as possible for herself and for her children. Some other examples of what coercion could look like. Again, most of these things are not illegal. But if you've got a parent who is consistently canceling or missing appointments or maybe puts a sign on the door and says, come back another time, um, that might be, again, something that gives you a sense of your own Six cents, your own gut that maybe something's not happening, for as, as, or something is happening that's getting in the way of the parent being able to bond with their children, have their decisions respected, live their life as fully as possible. Um, and again, some of these things you may not know about, but some of these things you may start to hear about, especially like not allowing to have friends over or going anywhere alone, um, threatens threatens her, to accusing her to be with someone else. So I'm not saying these are the kind of things you're going to find out right away while you're getting to know people, of course, but they're just things to be looking, looking at. These, this, this is what coercion could look like in a relationship, and it looks, look, what can happen if a person tries to resist any of these things? What could be the consequence or the retaliation? And the last term we'll be looking at is violence and the link between domestic violence and reproductive and sexual coercion. So, you know, we've often, it makes total sense that, you know, if you are in an abusive relationship, you may not have um, as much decision making, you may not have as much shared decision making about what happens around birth control and family planning. And so it makes total sense that you may be more at risk for a repeat pregnancy or unintended pregnancy. And it makes sense if you're a person in an abusive relationship that violence can increase a re risk of for unplanned pregnancies. But what Futures Without Violence, this is where this image comes from, did, is they linked these two together. So it makes, you know, instead of, for instance, it's, you know, it's kind of like it's this age-old problem of like a fancy term, reproductive and sexual coercion, for an age-old problem of if I don't get to make choices around my birth control or if someone's messing with my birth control or I don't get to make choices around family planning, what's going on. So we don't, again, need to use, have people be labeled with this term necessarily, but it just helps us understand that for some families you're working with, maybe this is the only thing that they'll be talking to you about, is like, what's access to birth control like? And are there forms of birth control that are available to them that their partner may not necessarily know about or feel? And they're not necessarily, and people aren't going to necessarily ask you that, but when you're doing your regular birth control information spiel and you talk about forms of birth control, you can just neutrally add to that conversation. And these, this form of birth control, your, your partner may, probably won't feel it when you're having intercourse or when you're engaged. Um, this form of birth control, you know, will interfere with your period. This form of birth control won't. You know, like a copper IUD, you'll still be having your periods even though you've got the IUD. And just like giving that information out because we just don't know what people are experiencing and the ways birth control can be sabotaged. So if you're in, living within an abusive relationship, some of what we've heard from um, women, and there's some big studies that Futures Without Violence did in Planned Parenthood clinics in California, which had a lot of people using their services, obviously, and on the National Domestic Violence Hotline. We also did a study where we asked people questions around reproductive and sexual coercion. And a lot of it broke down kind of into these categories. So you know, putting holes in condoms, pulling an IUD out by the string, um, forcing a partner to terminate a pregnancy, forcing a partner to go forward with a pregnancy, not letting people have family planning decisions, you know, input into family planning decisions, coercing, you know, not being willing to wear a condom, 
um, pressuring people to have more kids when they're not ready to. So all of those things fall within this understanding of that the behavior is using partner is used the partner is using behavior again to maintain power and control in a relationship that they're all related to reproductive health. And maybe this will be the way some of those conversations, some of what's going on in people's lives gets revealed for you, might be through the doorway of um, family planning and access to birth control. And we have some resources at the end of the webinar that we're going to talk about that um, will give you, some, give you a chance to be able to talk with partners, people a little bit more fully. So that's the end of our shared language discussion. Before we move on to the actual talking about the sc preferred screening tools, I just want to take a pause and give people a question to a chance to ask any questions in the chat box. We've, I've got help here from Jenny. We'll try to like organize like questions. So I'm just going to give you like, you know, give you a minute here, add some questions if you have. No questions so far. Everyone is feeling comfortable with those terms and what I've brought up. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to the screening tools. So why? Oh. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> All right. So screening. Why are we doing it? Again, as we first talked about it um, at the beginning of the webinar, not knowing about the existence of coercion and abuse in a family, in a relationship, can really undermine your good work. And it also really comes from the perspective that we, we see families and the folks we're working with holistically. Everything is connected. And the best way to support the parent-child bond is to understand what, what people's daily life is like and then to figure out what kind of impact the abuse is having and what people want and need. And then your intervention will be that much more effective. So it's not, a, it's not something to apologize for, but it really has to do with our delivery and how we do it. And we're going to get into that in a moment. And another thing that I think is really wonderful for us to know when we talk together and you know, when people are given an opportunity to talk about abuse, they were four times more likely to use an intervention. So Future Stop Violence is a nice study about that that we can rely on. I think our common sense tells us that, but it's nice to know that if you've got a supervisor or if you've got someone out in the world who isn't quite sure about screening, that actually done well provides an opportunity for people to get more of what they need. Okay. So what screening tools are we going to be talking about today? We're going to talk about the two preferred screening tools um, that you all have seen promoted quite a bit from the Department of Early Learning and Thrive. And for some of you who are receiving federal dollars, some of these tools may be something you're required to use. Uh, I think there are good things about both of them that we can talk about and share. Um, that could be used, that could be useful to what you're already doing, supplementing what you're doing, but Really what I like about especially the safety cards is they and, and the relationship assessment tool is they're really trying to promote the respect digni and dignity of the, of the survivor that you're working with. And you notice that I use the term, I will use the term survivor as opposed to victim because victim is criminal legal language and I feel like the term survivor is one that's come from people who have lived through abusive relationships and, they, and that's a term that that's really come out of the advocacy movement that people see themselves as who are experiencing and living with abuse or have come through it as survivors. Okay, looks like we have, a, I see we have a couple of questions and we're going to have a place, so we're not losing it because it's in the chat box, we're going to have a place to get to them and we will make sure that we answer everyone's question. Okay, so before, though, you screen, for those of you, even for those of you who have been doing screening for a while, it might be not a bad thing to check in with yourself, and for those of you who haven't been doing it all, to just ask yourself a few questions. How long have you been doing home visitations? How comfortable are you with this family? 
have you had any experience interacting with families on other kinds of tough conversations? Thinking about your your parents in your families, do they are they willing to ask you questions? Do they willingly provide you for information? Or maybe the only time you have questions with families is a couple times a year. I think I've talked to some folks with the Parent Child Home Program. Sometimes they only ask questions. I think I understand at the beginning of the year and maybe other very strategic check-in points, but it's not something that's happening all the time. And then think about for yourself: what have you noticed about the parents? Um, how do they react to you giving them referrals? And then lastly, a little homework for all of you. Have you actually talked to someone on the, the domestic violence hotline before? Have you called and said, hey, I'm Lee, I'm a home visitor. I just kind of want to know what to expect when if I asked a family member to call you, if I referred, what is it like, what, kind of, what, what can I expect? Have you called the local advocacy program in your community? And there may be more than one. I think that's a great thing to do. The other thing that I think is helpful to do, even if you already have, even if you're already doing active screening now, is to take a step back and think about what do you need as an individual home visitor? What kind of support do you need when doing screening? And then what kind of organizational support needs to be happening? What kind of support do you need from your supervisor? So have you, have you with your peers and or with the supervisor, talked about together Maybe there's two of you, maybe there's six of you, when and how you're going to introduce the tools to the parent. Have you as a group, individually and as a group, reflected back on that experience together? Because maybe there's challenges that have come up that your peer or your supervisor might be able to help you address, something you hadn't thought about before. And we always say, give yourself some time and go back and try again. But I think what that helps folks do if they haven't shared with their peers or their supervisor is build a shared understanding on how to use the tool. And then you can think about what kind of impact this is having on the family because we don't want to do we don't want to do further harm. Whatever we're doing, we don't want to make things worse for people. And we know that we're intersecting for people's lives for a very small moment in time, even though you all are going in there sometimes week after week and some programs twice a week, there's a whole lot of time you're not there and you want to make sure that the information you're offering and the conversation that you're starting around domestic and possibly sexual violence isn't going to put people in a further compromised position. And, you know, the, we know, as, and you all know, that when you're more comfortable, you'll be more open and ready for whatever comes up, for what the family member tells you as their priority, their needs. And then you'll be partnering together. You'll know what works for one family. Maybe that doesn't work for another family, but you'll be able to step back, I think, more easily if you all have some of these conversations with your peers or supervisor and figure out how to keep the mom, that parent, that child at the center of whatever intervention that you are um, offering. Okay, so that's getting ready and maybe rethinking how you're introducing the tools right now. So let's just talk about the strategies for actually using some using the safety card in the relationship assessment tool. So one of the first strategies we want to talk about is having conversations to build rapport. Well, of, of course, you all do that in so many ways because you are having conversations about things. Sometimes they're tough and sometimes they're not. It's just like easy and you're providing resources and help and people are really grateful to have you there. But we do know, and here we have another study to back it up to maybe share with your peers or supervisor that if you aren't first having conversations to build rapport, and we think the safety card can help you with that, that it's going to be really hard for people to talk to you about what's going on. Like, we know using language like, is domestic violence happening, or are you being, are you afraid at home, or are you being abused, really most of the time people are going to say no to those questions because for all the complicated reasons we're going to talk about in a moment. So. And one of the chief reasons why people have a hard time talking to us about what's going on is their fears around mandatory reporting and what's going to happen with their children. So getting clear about confidentiality, what people can share with you, um, what what you're required, that being very clear with people around confidentiality, that the conversations that they have with you will be privileged, will be kept confidential with some few exceptions and what those exceptions are around 
child abuse and mandatory reporting and being clear about what that is. And for not, we could do this in another training, but just to state, in our state, under our laws, exposure, so being in the home where domestic violence is happening, exposure in and of itself is not a mandatory report for child abuse unless the child is directly in harm's way, like the mom is holding a child and the partner is trying to hit or harm the parent and they're holding a child or they throw something at the mom who's holding the child or they you know, pull a weapon on the mom and the child is there. That, that would be uh, still a mandatory report. But, just, but living in it, knowing it's happening, knowing the course of behaviors are going on, knowing that the parent's been hit but the child wasn't in the room or knowing the parent's been hurt but the child wasn't there is not a mandatory report. Now that doesn't mean that we're not totally concerned about kids and we don't want to do everything we can for the mom and the kid to have violence-free and coercive-free lives. It's just that that's not the, the, there are other tools that we want to use to do that. And advocacy can, working with domestic violence advocates can help in that and there are other resources in the community. So we want to get those conversations going first to build rapport. So we really like these safety cards that Futures developed because it really is a universal education moment. So all of us um, have some way probably to talk. We want everybody to talk about what healthy relationships look like and what, healthy re and what unhealthy relationships don't look like. So basically we want everyone talking about relationships. So let me just take a moment here and I'm going to do a little poll and ask you all to click on the little hand that we showed you at the beginning. How many of you all have have seen the Healthy Moms Happy Babies? Could you just click on it if you have? So it looks like maybe Half of the people have seen this card. How about hanging out or hooking up? You can keep your hand out, if, hand up if you've seen that. Put it down if you haven't. Okay. And then the last card, Caring Relationships Healthy You. Put your hand up if you've seen that card or pull it down if you haven't. Okay. So Healthy Moms, Happy Babies. Um, is the card that is a part of the, the recommended card for home visitors and has questions that speak directly in the home visiting com, um, context. It does use she. Hanging out or hooking up is aimed at youth that may be in abusive relationships and uses not in gender language, it says my partner. And caring relationships healthy you is a brand new card that's just been developed by Futures with the LGBTQ community, so the lesbian, gay, trans, bi, community and it has non-gendered language and has some other questions that also specifically get at maybe some of the ways um, a partner could interfere and limit the choices for um, folks who are living in same gender, who are experiencing abuse or in same gendered relationships. So, um, and we'll talk to you about where you can get these, but they're all free and they're all on the Futures website. So they all have this approach that we really think is so helpful to open up the conversation with folks. When you're handing out the safety card for folks, it's, it's a brief intervention. It doesn't require people to disclose that they're victims. That's why we like the don't ask, just tell approach. So you don't have to ask somebody if you're a victim. You don't have to figure it out ahead of time. If you're just part of your um, home visiting work that you're doing, hey, I just went to this new training. I just got this new information. We're giving this out to all the families that we work with. It's just information to get out there um, where people don't have to disclose and be stigmatized first. They don't feel like they have to say yes or no to a screening conversation. It introduces the conversation around healthy relationships. It, let that person, it lets that person know that you're someone they can talk to. Even if they don't talk right at the moment, they can come back to it. And you can come back to it with the card, and it gives a connection to advocacy. And it's respectful and it's dignified. Here's some of the language if you've never looked in the card. This is the approach it has on the first when you open up the Healthy Moms Happy Babies card. And all these cards, this first panel has this approach. How's it going? Do I feel respected, cared for, and nurtured by my partner? That's the way I would want somebody to talk to me. Not have I, am I afraid at home? Is my partner hurting me? Have I been slapped? 
choked hit that's run down the stairs in the last six months or in my lifetime? Am I experiencing forced sex? It talks to people the way we, what we hope for, what we're aspirational for. And on bad days, so I just pulled out another panel of the card. So as you move through the card, you might be the first person, and it, you give the people the card, people just have a chance to look at it. You may have to read with somebody. Some, these cards are done, most of them are in Spanish and some in other languages. But you might be the first person who's talking to them about what is going on in their relationship and what they deserve or don't do. But this isn't the second panel. It gets a little bit further down into the card. <laughs> So it gets that conversation open, and we're going to talk about how to respond to folks who say yes and no in a few minutes or if you suspect something. But again, if you're just giving out this information, it's universal education, it's an opportunity for connection for building trust. Here's a quote from one of the home visitors' um, sites and, uh, that I really thought was useful to share. The Home Visitors Our site have always done a great job of talking to families about violence in the home. However, they now feel they have a tool of the card that actually enhances the conversation and elicits more information than the standard questions about hitting, punching, choking. We found that many women say no to this. However, when they read some of the questions on the Healthy Moms Happy Babies cards, it's brought up some pretty significant disclosures of powerlessness, emotional abuse, and control by their partner. So whatever someone's you know, um, images of a victim or someone who's abusive, whatever that image is, most people don't feel like their partner or their experience fits that because of the stigma and the fear and the concern and all the things we talked about earlier that is surrounds what's going to happen if someone says, yes, this is happening to me. But if you're talking about how you're being treated and respected, what's happening with your decisions, it does open the door for you finding out what's going on without people feeling um, stigmatized or labeled. So the other tool that we're going to talk about a little bit is the relationship assessment tool. So let's do this poll again. Just you just, ever, so right now, clear your hands out. Everybody who has their hands up, do a clearance. <laughs> and then I'll give you a second to clear your hands down. Almost all down. How many people? have, are using the relationship assessment tool now? Let's see a show of hands on that. Okay, so it doesn't look like a ton of people are. Maybe a third of you are using it now. So if you're part of a federally funded program, a VIC-V program, you're being required to use this tool. Correct, Jenny? Jenny's nodding her head at me. Yeah. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about it. Um, so if you're not a federally funded program, you're not required to use this tool. But in case you see it or it's coming your way, I want to tell you a little bit about it. It was developed in the 1990s, and it was originally named the Women's Experience with Battering. And the assessment tool, this tool is really trying to measure women's experience and relationships. So it's not it's not just focusing on physical abuse. I think I've seen some people are using the HITS tool out there, which I find is very limited in screening for the experience of someone living with domestic violence because it's so focused on physical abuse and fun sexual. This tool is assessing for emotional abuse by measuring a woman's perceptions of her vulnerability to physical danger, so her perceptions, and her loss of power and control in the relationship which, as we talked about earlier, could be all kinds of things. So the research has proved that this tool is more sensitive and comprehensive for screening compared with other tools that focus primarily on physical assault, like HITS, um, which, again, I'm just going to say I think that's not effective and could even be harmful because, you know, even though this tool also has a, numbers that you come up with and tells you if someone has reach 20 points, then they are positive for intimate partner violence. But what it's also giving you information is even if people are below 20 points, they still need support and help. So I think that's what's important to see, is that you're getting that information of what's going on with the, with the parent, the mom you're working with, her perception of what's happening in her relationship. And, and if they score 15, 
if someone says they feel ashamed of the things their partner does to them and all they get on this tool is a six, strongly agree, I would still feel like that person needs some support and help. So I really think that that does a better job. Um, the way it's supposed to be administered is face-to-face. -face. There's a series of 10 questions. We only have three up here, statements that ask, actually 10 statements that ask a woman to say how safe she feels. It has also been tested that you could change the language to make it non-gender. So you can use this tool with same gendered relationships. But I would always use the safety card first. So here's a strategy, folks. I would always use, always give out the safety card first before you get to this relationship assessment tool. Because what that's doing is that you're signaling to someone that you're signaling to that mom or that parent that, hey, I'm somebody you can talk to about healthy and unhealthy relationships. But I think we have to also talk about other ways to, to do this RAT, to do this relationship assessment tool. So I guess if I was a home visitor, because I think about it from my advocacy role, I would probably memorize those questions or memorize those statements. I might introduce one or two of them in one visit, and I go back and fill in that information for myself. Because depending what families you're in, you're going to maybe have to figure out how do you define these terms to fit the cultural context or language. I remember when I was an advocate working um, with, uh, even working with deaf folks and trying to figure out how do I define what violence is because there's so many different definitions for violence in the conceptual ASL language when I was working with an interpreter. We had to think about it, like what, how did we want to describe what we were getting at for people or coercion or abuse. And the same thing, if you're working in a different language or different cultural context, you might want to take some time with those terms. You're going to use the, work the questions in over time and go back and fill it out. There's nothing that says you have to have that sheet in front of you and give it to a person and say, fill this out and give it back to me. You may feel like that's something you can do and you may feel comfortable with doing that, but there are lots of ways to integrate this and it's all about your approach. And so um, if it feels like you've, your visit, you've done some forms, you don't need to do another form. You can do it another time. Because we know survivors have been surviving before we came along. They've been figuring out how to keep themselves and their families safe before we came along. And we have time to integrate these questions in to get the information. So maybe you have to have this relationship assessment tool done by the end of six months. Well, that's a long, that's a long time. There's nothing that says you have to have this all done the first visit or the second visit you go out there. But I do think if you look at it from the perspective of providing you with information that helps you understand what this family best need, what this mom may need to best support her parent-child bond, there's value in using this assessment tool. You can just figure out the different ways to use it. Okay, so let's, um, the next piece we're going to do is getting to what if the response is yes, what if she won't talk to me about it, what if the response is no. But I want to pause for a moment and give you all a chance to put some questions in um, the chat box and let's see what people are asking about. Yeah, so let's, we're going to go back and answer a few questions. So Jenny, you want to take Read that out loud. Yeah, so I'll read the first question that was asked. It was referencing the slide that had the statistic up about the four times more likely to use a DV intervention. So it's asking, is that statistic four times more likely to use a DV intervention, or is it that about participation in HV intervention? It's about a DV intervention. So they're four times more likely if they're able to talk about abuse to you to use something that's related to supporting them around their abuse. And yeah, that's what it was about more generally. Yes. Okay. And the second question, I have a client. She is in domestic violence, but she does not want to accept it. What can I do to help her? And it looks like there was an attempt to send with a therapist, but the client declined because she said she was fine. All right. And we'll get to that in a few moments when we talk about what if you get a no. Let's see if there are any other questions. And then I think Lee touched a little bit about this um, regarding the deaf clients that she had. And this question is asking, any specific advice for working with minority cultures in which DV is accepted, 
tolerated and or normal? And how about with the complication of language issues and lack of resources? So my specific advice about working in cultures where you feel, or working in communities where you feel like domestic violence is accepted, tolerated has quotation marks around it, normal, oh, normal had quotation marks around it, is that you're talking with someone who is, you're, ta you're probably working with a parent or mom who is weighing all the time what's happening, what are the risks to me individually from the person, my partner who may be causing harm, and what are my life risks out there in the world? Like what resources are actually out there for me? What, what could happen if I said no? What could happen if I try to choose something differently? And they're constantly weighing those pros and cons of like what are the risks individually? What are the, what are the life generated risks as well? So I, wouldn't, I would say that you're dealing with someone who's trying to figure that out and do the things that maybe you're asking them to do or, or you're trying to get, give them support. So if you take it from that approach that you know the person you're dealing with has individual risks and life generated risks, it's not so much that the violence is accepted or tolerated, but what are really her resources and what's really her ability to get the things that she needs and how can you help her once she's defined what her priorities are and what will make herself and her family safest, get those things. So it's not so much that I really don't believe that people are, are, to, are accepting or tolerating. They're just trying to figure out how to, how to navigate through those risks. And maybe what they grew up in was physically harsher or coercively even worse. And this situation is, has more movement. But again, they're still rank weighing those risks at every time. And I would also add that the in-person domestic violence training for day one and day two also goes over this piece a little bit more in depth. So if you've not been able to participate in one of those, I definitely recommend doing that. Um, the life-generated risks that Lee just mentioned is something that is touched on in depth. So I think that would be beneficial if you want to dive deeper. Yeah, we get a chance to practice a lot around um, what does it mean to help for, for home visitors who are interested, what does it mean to go that go further and really trying to support people and <clears throat> connecting with advocacy and getting what they need, even if they're not ready to talk to domestic violence advocates. And the complication of language issues, absolutely. I don't know if you get to work with, if you yourself work in the, speak the language of the families you work with or you have to rely on interpreters, that absolutely makes it harder. Um, and resources, what's real and perceived, what's real and knowing what's around in your community is a challenge too. This is again where I think partnering with advocacy programs can be helpful because our programs, if they're receiving federal dollars, are often, well, they're at least required to have access to language bank lines, but they often work with interpreters. They hire advocates of the community who's, that's their first language. And they may know of some resources you don't know about. And I say the same thing to advocates. You all have got resources you don't know about. Um, Housing is a huge issue, and there are a number of housing first initiatives in our state that advocates are connected to that home visitors may not know about. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, there's two more, so we'll try to get through those. So the next question is, if a woman has limited appointments without a partner, how can you bring up these issues in a smooth yet efficient way? I think that's a great question. I would probably start, I would start with the safety card and say, you know, However you like to do this, this is new information I got at a training. We're giving this to all the families we work with. And um, I just wanted to share it with you. Just want to give you a chance to look at it. Talk about what we hope for in healthy relationships. If there are any questions, we can talk about it. And just give yourself some time. So I would, bring, I would share that card first. And then maybe another visit is when you would bring up statements, questions that were on that relationship assessment tool. You don't have to actually have the form in front of you. But you could, as we said earlier, memorize some of the questions, put in your own words to get at those perceptions. Because the reason why you want to know is not just to be nosy, right, but to figure out, OK, if, if you feel like you can't leave the home without your partner's permission, but we're asking you to go to do these appointments around parenting and stuff, like what are some different strategies? How can we, what are ways you can get out of your home? What, what's permissible with your partner? So, Give yourself time, break it up, but I would definitely start with the card. I also think talking about healthy relationships is a great starting point as well, making it universal, something we want for all, all relationships, all people. 
I think helps as well. So you're not targeting domestic violence per se, but really just thinking about healthy relationships and what you want for that mom. And how we all want to be treated. I want right. to be respected. <laughs> right? We want our decisions respected. So it's really coming at the approach of it's aspirational, what we all hope for. Nobody has to be labeled a victim. Correct. So the next question, our program is requiring us to, to complete the web by the fifth or seventh visit. I feel at times this can be too early and may not be beneficial. What is your opinion? <clears throat> Well, I trust your gut. I feel like if you can, again, memorize some of those statements, questions, um, and work them into your conversation and see how that's going, I think even if a partial filling out of the relationship assessment tool is fine. I think I, I did ask um, Department of Early Learning, there is a place where if you feel like it's going to cause harm, you can say that you didn't do the tool because of safety issues, and I think that's a place to mark in your data. If you can see that like even touching on these questions, this person has abject fear in their face because they're not sure what's going to happen when you leave and will their partner find out. So I think you have to be able, I think you have to be upfront about saying information shared between us is confidential with your exceptions. I want you to know that um, nobody gets to see our records. Um, I think it's important to separate for you all to separate, however you want to say that in your own words, but to convey that information because survivors are really worried about, like, is my partner going to find out who's going to see this information? And that may reassure people and be more willing to share with you. And then I think you piecemeal in as far as you can go. And if, it's, and if you feel like it's a safety issue, you acknowledge that. So a couple more questions <clears throat> came in, and one is, are the safety cards available in multiple languages? And a link was placed above, I'm not sure if you all have access to it, we can put it in the chat box as well, where they can be ordered. So the cards can be ordered for free, however you do have to pay for shipping. And they are available in Spanish. I'm not sure about other languages. Some, uh, yeah, so they're, most of them are available in Spanish. And by the way, the shipping charge is, is $10 for no matter how many cards you order. So I order the max, which is like 300 in every card. So I'm getting like, you know, 1200 I don't know, I'm getting a lot and it's still only $10. Um, I think they're working on um, Vietnamese. Some of them are in Vietnamese, some of them are in Chinese, but yes, yeah, they're limited. So again, it's like you may be taking that approach of the safety card, like use that same approach, use that same language. If you're a home visitor whose primary language is the same, first language is the same language the moms you're working with, you may be the one um, translating, does my partner respect me? and listen to my decisions in the appropriate language to get at it. But use that approach, that approach of hope and what we all want for. We're going to get to the, if you don't want to go to the shelter in a moment. Um, and then there's another <clears throat> question that just came through, which is rather long. Um, so let me read it. So one of the last questions on our client intake for MSS is, has the father of your baby threatened you in any way during the last year? I am a community health worker and only see patients at this intake. Do you have any, do you have any suggestions on how to ask this question in a different way that might allow more women to answer honestly? Yes, I would use that first question on the on the um, healthy moms happy babies card. Is your partner kind to you and respectful of your decisions, or kind and respectful of you? To go back and look, <laughs> I would use that approach. And then you will be opening the door to a conversation as opposed to just answering the specific question that I think will eventually get at you being able to know if the father of the baby is threatening that is threatening the mom you're working with. Because threatened, threaten you can mean so many things. Threaten you can mean, you know, I don't want you to go out with anybody else. I want you to only be with me. Threaten you can mean I'm going to, you know, tell your mom or your dad or your job, your a lesbian and you're going to lose your job. I mean, we don't even know what threatened you means. So you got to open the door to that conversation. So I would take the positive approach of how are things going in the relationship? How are things going with the dad? How is the dad with the baby? How's the dad with you? Open it up more broadly and eventually you'll get to that question. So those were the questions. As we mentioned, we'll get back to shelter in a moment. 
So we're going to dive back into the PowerPoint portion, and we'll keep monitoring the questions as we go through, and be sure that we answer them by the end of the webinar. And I, I guess I just want to add and say, you may no, never ask the question specifically this way, has the father of your baby threatened you in any way during the last year? You may find out the answer to that question, but you may not ever actually be saying it quite that way. But I think if, you're, if you are opening the door and have rapport built with your mom, you will get to the, you will learn whether that's happening or not. Okay, so back to our conversations. So what if, so let's, we'll go the easiest route first. What if someone says to you, yes, actually some of this stuff is going on with me? So I think what's really important we don't want to overlook is we really want to clearly validate what people say to us. We never want to ask a question that we don't have an answer for. So if someone is saying yes to any of the questions, either on the safety card or in the relationship assessment tool, I think it's really cri it's critical to always have some validation statement that you feel comfortable with. So here's some examples, and I think it's always, re always really critical to ask also, how can I support you? So some of you may have some others that you've come up with. But remember, we don't want to ask a question we don't have an answer to, and we always want to ask how we can support the person if they're saying yes to us. So let's get to the trick here. Why won't she talk to me about it or talk to me more honestly about it? What's going on? So as we said earlier, just looking at the your answers to the questions of what comes up for me when I, you know, what, what's hard about starting the initial screening process? What comes up with me with, for follow-up conversations? Your answers are really reflected in, this, in the same fears that, and the same concerns we see coming from survivors. So there's a lot of shame or embarrassment, fear or retaliation from the partner or their family at large, their extended family, not having good experience with any system in the past, having bad experiences, so there's not good trust in systems. Um, really finding it hard to step outside the community to get services or feeling like um, you don't want to share what's going on in your household. There would be shame brought to your community if you aired your dirty laundry. A lot of fear around being judged for the decisions the survivor is making. Again, remember weighing all those things that are happening or being told what to do. Maybe violence isn't happening right now. Maybe things are okay or are okay for the survivor. She's been in a worse situation things are better right now. There still could be a lot of coercion happening, but maybe violence isn't happening. Minimization, it's not like people don't know stuff isn't good, but it's a coping mechanism. How do we get through the day when you, you know, when your economic situation, your housing situation, and everything is pretty precarious, and maybe you're dealing with really low income, minimization may be a coping, coping mechanism. Or maybe you just don't get access to the funds privacy, worried about where the information would go. What are the benefits of disclosing? Do the benefits of disclosing outweigh the risk to the survivor? Though all those things are playing into why a person may not fully reveal to you what's happening. I really like to step back from honestly because I think people are still weighing like what they can share with you, what they can't. So can they fully reveal to you what's going on? Can they talk to you at all because of all these fears of what might be happening, all these concerns and worries? That is the backdrop. That's what's under the water. That's, you know, you're the tip of the iceberg. That's what's under the water. That's what's happening that you may get glimpses of and you may not. So if you can just know that that complex thing is happening, there's a way you can respond to people when they're not talking, when they're like flat out telling you, no, it's not happening, or um, minimizing in your mind what's happening or not revealing all because it's still an opportunity to build connection and trust. If the person you're talking with doesn't feel embarrassed by you or judged by you or like, you know, your eyebrow doesn't go up with like a really, an unspoken really, or feel shamed by you, there's somebody they can come and talk, they can come and talk to you later. So I just put together some framing statements that or sample statements that I've used in the past before when women have said to me no or maybe a part of what I think is happening. And I'm talking about people who have sat in front of me with a broken nose. So I'm talking about people who have had visible signs of 
violence happening. They said to me, no, everything is fine. I don't want them to feel judged or shamed by me, so I have said these things. I'm so glad to hear that. Should anything change, know that I'm here. These are some other statements that I've said. I know talking about relationships can be hard. I'm always willing to hear about what's happening, what's going on with you and your children. There are a lot of good things happening for you right now, but if things should change, I'm here. I'm really trying to work from a place of like non-judgment, non-shaming. You don't have to be embarrassed of me. I know it's really tough to talk about this stuff. You don't know me that well. You know, people have said to me, I fell down when I thought their bruise came from somewhere else. I mean, I'd say, glad to know your partner didn't cause those, but I have to tell you, you know, I've seen this happen before. I just want you to know I'm, I'm here. Help is available if you need it. So it's really, again, it's about your delivery. It's trying to come from a place of, like, you're still there. If anything should change, it's not going to be a big, it's not going to be something that hopefully people feel ashamed about. And people have said to me, survivors, that, like, they took information from me and hit it someplace in their shoe or hit it in their purse and maybe it was like six months later or maybe it was a year later because when I used to work at programs that they felt like they were ready to talk about what was happening. I mean, you all do have the advantage that even if within the screening period you're not finding out you're, the family you're working with, the mom you're working with isn't revealing to you that domestic abuse is happening. But the point is, as we all, you know, we all share this goal of wanting the parent-child connection to be supported and families to live healthy and stable lives, right? So who cares if it doesn't come out in that six-month period? If it comes out a year later, you're still going in there because you get to work with this family for 18 months or maybe two years, and that's when she's ready or feels like she can trust talking to you. That will be a success. So the other strategy with this is, though, to reflect and try again. So you go back. And you talk to you, you talk to your peers or your supervisor and say, okay, I really, my gut's telling me something's going on. I feel like more is happening. How, I want to have an opportunity to try again. I want to think about it. Give me some feedback. What have you all done in the past? How do you think, you know, get that support to try again. So that basically, even if you get a no, not maybe next week, but, you know, a month later, you could use the card. Hey, I want to just check in with you. I gave you this card before in the past. Did you have any questions about it? Use that. The one thing we do want to say is that we don't want to use, especially the relationship tool with both partners and family members, because it's really focused on the perceptions of the person who's going through the abuse. And if you're using it with everybody, if you're using the relationship tool universally, you're basically giving information to everybody about, um, you're, you might be helping somebody be a better abuser, actually, because you're giving them information about what to expect that's going to be coming from you, the home visitor. So now they have more information to go back and say to the person they're targeting, oh, is the home visitor asking you about this? Is the home visitor asking you about that? So the card we see is universal education. This, the relationship assessment tool is really not geared to be used with both partners at all. You could do harm. And if you have safety concerns around screening, don't screen. From what I understand from the Department of Early Learning, you have a place to indicate it could have caused more harm. So one more set of strategies before we get to the questions. So let's say you get that no or you get the like minimization or you're just, you just want to come back to it. You have a sixth sense. You can at a time, again, trusting your gut. Last time we talked, I shared this card with you about healthy relationships. Do you have any questions? Another way to get at it is, do you think it might be helpful for friends or family? You see the statements here. I, I don't need to read all of them to you, but I think that here are different ways to kind of open the conversation to find out what's going on to support your intervention and to support the mom and child. You know, what are your biggest worries? Has anything changed? Any surprises? Do you want any information about birth control that your partner wouldn't have to know about or that may not be, you know, your partner wouldn't have to feel. So sometimes I've talked with women about, you know, you can get an IUD and get the strings cut off. Then your partner wouldn't feel it. That's a way to go about it. Um, and you could still have your period. Um, you can get other forms of birth control that your partner's less likely to know about. I know a lot of things are good happening now, but is there anything that's making things hard for you? So different, these are just different ways to kind of open that door to the conversation, come back to it, 
just being signaling again to that family member, that mom, that parent, you're somebody they can talk to about relationships. And we're going to get to questions. I just want to close this one section by saying, whoops, three things you, you can keep in mind that will help you. Like you're dealing with the, the complexity of people's lives and you don't have to fix it. And you sometimes your best resource is a survivor because they've been figuring this stuff out, weighing all the pros and cons, the life generator risks, the battery generator, the abuser's generator risks before you came along. And they're going to continue to do it between your visits. To ask them what's worked and what's been helpful is a, is a wonderful question to go back to. And to help connect to advocates. We'll get to that in the last section. And I haven't forgot your question about shelter person. So now let's take another minute or so to put some questions into the chat box before we move on to the next section. OK. What do we got here, Jenny? So we did receive a comment in regards to the screening tool not being recommended to use with both partners because it may increase the risk of harm and give the abuser more strategy on how to abuse, quote unquote, better. So just keeping that in mind, that was an interesting comment, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is that you're, you're, if, you, if we understand that living in an abusive relationship is about what tactics do, does a person have to use to maintain power over someone else in that relationship, then it's not about sitting on your hands. It's not about just like when you get angry, take a deep breath and count to 10. So if, if that mom values the visit with you and values the conversation, the person causing harm may be saying, like, well, what are you talking about? What does she want to know about me? What does she want to know about us? Well, you better not be saying anything. And then you show them something like the relationship assessment tool, and it's like, oh, do you feel like you're, I can't remember some of the statements, do you feel like your partner um, keeps you trapped in your home or doesn't let you see other people? Or Then they're like, are you talking about this with that person? So it's, again, coming from the perspective of understanding that living in an abusive relationship is not about single physical acts of a physical abuse or sexual abuse, but it's about living in an environment where you're, you, you're, the fundamental harm is loss of autonomy and your decisions are undermined, your authority is undermined, and your sense of self is questioned. And you can see how that would work. But right. thank you for noting that. And there was another question that asks, what kinds of conversations do you recommend when giving this screening to a parent who was previously in a DV relationship but is no longer involved with a partner? So if we're talking just about the safety cards, then I think it's I think then again it's just coming from the perspective of any relationship we enter into, we want to make sure that there you know that we that we're treated well and that any relationship we're engaged in is a healthy relationship. So I think with these are things to just think about when we're entering into any relationship. And Dating and co-parenting will continue. Thank you, Jenny. That's a key piece. There may be co-parenting that's continuing with the child of the who was the person causing harm, who was the abusive person. So, and I think with the relationship assessment tool, um, they may not be in a relationship right at the moment. So I think that that would be a question back at the, I think that would be a supervisor, supervisory organizational question to say, if I'm required to give a screening tool out and, my, and the mom I'm giving it to is no longer in a relationship, including co-parenting, because I think if they were co-parenting, there might be perceptions on that, there might be answers on that relationship assessment tool that would still be useful for you. But if, if the partner's totally out of the picture, the, parental person, is, the co-parent is totally out of the picture, and they're not involved in um, a relationship, I think that would be a question I would have back to the supervisor. What are we going to do um, consistently around this question? Maybe you hold off on the relationship assessment tool. Maybe you just use the safety card. I think, I don't know, Jenny, if you have another opinion from the Department of Early Learning's perspective. I think what Lise mentioned was great. So I think bringing that back to your supervisor and having that conversation, I think also just keeping in mind that maybe that mom will get into a relationship at some point in the future. And so still being able to have that open dialogue and trusting conversation about healthy relationships and what that looks like, especially if she reveals to you that she was in a previous DV relationship, I think it's important to be able to have that conversation in an open way 
so that she can think about respect and trust and feeling safe in a relationship, especially with a child. So I think there's still a way to have that conversation. I'm not sure the delivery method of the relationship assessment tool in that given context, but I think still having the conversation would be really vital. And if she ends up in a new relationship, you can always return to the relationship assessment tool at a later time. And again, it might be something where you're memorizing some of those statements and working it into your conversations, not just handing a piece of paper over to somebody. Okay, next. Are there That's any it. more questions? So that captures all the questions up until this point. Okay, great. So we can feel free to continue to send them in, and we'll be monitoring them throughout the rest of the PowerPoint and we can get to them at the end. So let's talk about resources and what do I mean when we talk about helping to connect to advocates. So I'm talking specifically about community-based domestic violence and sexual assault advocates. So these are advocates that are not employed. Um, the term advocate is used for a lot of people these days, but they're not employed at the, by the prosecutor, so they're not working at the working for the prosecutor or the city attorney, or they're not working at the police station. They can be advocates there, but I'm talking about the community-based folks, so uh, non-governmental, non-profits, YWCAs, individual organizations. Sometimes they have unique structures with city and county government, but they still have that autonomy because confidentiality is handled with domestic violence and sexual assault advocates at the highest level, just like a lawyer-client relationship. But if you're an advocate employed by the criminal legal system, your information would be shared So with the prosecutor or with police. So I want you to know that when you're referring people to the local domestic violence and sexual assault advocates in your communities, you can, be, you can rest assured that they are required by Washington law to maintain confidentiality and legal privilege over written communication and records. And so that, I just want to say that because people want some reassurance about that. And when you call in, you don't have to give your real name. You can say whatever name you want to say. Their job essentially is to really listen and believe the survivor's story, to do the things the survivor needs and wants, what their priorities are, to help with safety planning, to help them navigate any system. So advocates can be mobile. They can get out of the office. They can go to school. They can go to court. They can go to the doctor's office. They can go wherever their survivor wants them to go. They can, go. they can work in the fields out in eastern Washington, as some of you all are doing home visiting out there. So um, they're great people to have on your team. And you may have a family member who doesn't want to talk to them, just wants to talk to you. It's fine for you to call up and brainstorm and get some problem solving and say, hey, I'm working with the family. This is what's happening. And they can also talk to friends and family of um, the survivor, they're going to maintain the survivor's confidentiality and privilege, but I've certainly had family members who are worried, say, I, I'm a sister, I don't know how to provide support, what can I do? People can call up. So it's a resource in your community for you to certainly use and or the survivor and um, know that that information is confidential, okay? Generally, okay, so first of all, all the services are free. Now, not all of our programs can offer all of these things, but generally, this is what you can expect from programs. They'll either be phone or in-person advocacy. You don't always have to come in, which is really great in parts of our state where there's one program co covering a whole county, and it's far geographically. They can go with people to appointments. As I said, they can help survivors navigate other systems. They can help provide interpreters or speak the language. Some of our programs have emergency shelters. Some of our programs have transitional. Um, some of our programs have support groups. They'll all offer support to children, friends, and families. Some of them are big enough to have specific programs for children, teens, and adults. And somebody asked earlier, what if they don't want to go to shelter? That's fine. Actually, the majority of services provided for folks calling our programs are, out, are not shelter. They can help you in all kinds of ways. You can call regardless of wanting shelter or not, or wanting housing or not. And some of our programs actually have housing to, as we said, transitional housing and can help people stay in their homes, the Housing First initiative. So it's, and it, that's another great reason to know they've got funds to help um, survivors hold onto their homes so they don't have to leave. So that's another great reason to know if there's that kind of a program happening in your community. So the majority of services that people seek with advocates, I think, is to help them navigate systems 
and to just talk something through with people. Most of our programs have 24-hour um, numbers at night, um, crisis lines they can talk to, as well as the national line. So, and I'll give you more of those resources, but that's, that's basically the overview. I think it's also important to know it's about what the woman wants, and I think keeping that in mind when you're seeking services or calling for resources, really having in the forefront what does the mom want, what works for her, because sometimes that's not shelter and sometimes that's not leaving. So kind of letting her lead that planning process for you and following her guidance on that, as Lee had mentioned prior in the webinar, she is the expert in this situation, and so really using her expertise to guide you through the planning process. I think sometimes people have a perception of calling a shelter. We had a colleague mention she thought a van just came right over with clothes and everything the woman might need, and they pick her up and take her away. And sometimes that's not what the woman wants, and so really keeping that in mind as you're working through the planning process. Yes, thank you, thank you, Jenny. And we do spend um, a good amount of time talking about strategies around um, how to help people stay safer when they're at home or outside, when they're staying at home or when they and they choose not to leave at this time at, at our training. So we'd encourage you to come to the training because we get a chance to really talk that through. So again, we just had a sample of what does it look like to make a supporter referral. So we're you know, you, you all do this work really well that you don't just, I know for all the kinds of things you do, you don't just hand people a phone number and say, call this place. But especially for calling a domestic violence or sexual assault advocacy program, I wouldn't use the language domestic violence or sexual assault advocacy. I might say things like, you know, we have, as I put up here, a warm connection. If you're comfortable, I have a colleague at a local program. She's an expert on what to do when people are in your situation or relationships are really hard or things are challenging and can talk to you about what, what support they offer and what, and what might be helpful for you. So I think that before you offer the advocacy resources, it's important for you to know the contact information, what the resource can do for her, and what she can expect. And one way to help you get that, I'm hoping this will work. This is a hyperlink I'm going to click on right now. I'm taking you. Okay, all right, Jenny's helping me. I'm taking you to our um, page, Get Help Now, on our website, which, as you can see, if you clicked up here at the top, it would take you to every DV program in our state, which we're not going to do right now. <laughs> it gives you the national hotline numbers. It tells you what to expect when you call a hotline, a program, what to expect if you go to shelter, what to expect if you work with a legal advocate. So it gives you some overview so that you can speak more knowledgeably to the mom when you, before you call. And let's see, let's, let's just try. We'll be, oh yeah, great. Okay, so it worked. So we, you can see our programs are organized by county and then you can click on a program and it'll tell you even more about what's going on. These are all hyperlinks. So that you have a better idea of what's um, happening before you Okay, how do we get back to the slideshow? I'm getting a little help before you get before you actually get the phone number. So that's part of your homework, and we're hoping to make it easy for you. Let's see. Do we want to take a let's let's take a pause right now before I go on to the other resources and answer some of these questions. Hopefully that helped with the shelter question. If you have any more details that you'd like on that, feel free to just go ahead and write in the question box and we'll be happy to get to that. So we did have a question about delivering the relationship assessment tool regardless if the mom has a partner or not at that time. And it looks like, yes, you should deliver it regardless if the woman is in a relationship or not at the moment and maybe be reflective on the recent relationship that she was previously in and have conversations on that. Sure, this is Laura Alfani and, um, and again just a, a, a reference that this is a requirement for some of the programs on the phone and maybe not for all of them but for those of which that this is a requirement within a timeline, a specific timeline, we do recommend using the tool within the period that is specified but the tool does allow for reflection back to previous relationships and would allow the conversation about experiences with healthy relationships in general. Um, so I think um, any other specific questions or individual conversations we can certainly have um, with the person who asked that question. Okay, to be super clear, I was wrong. 
this is Lee, <laughs> be super clear, I was wrong. So if you're a program that's required to use the relationship assessment tool, even if they're currently not in a relationship, have them reflect back on previous relationships and still, you know, you should introduce it that way to say, hey, I know you're not currently in a relationship right now, so we're going to just have a conversation about what, what's, what's it been like for you in some of your previous relationships and integrate maybe some of the statements in slowly over one, more than one conversation, maybe not all at once. You're the best judge of that, but I appreciate that clarity. Thank you. So that was Laura Afani from Department of Early Learning, if people don't know who she is. Thank you, Laura. Also okay. just wanted to reference that a question came up regarding that because it looks like there was a conflict in what Lee and I were saying and advice provided from Department of Health, whom collects the data for the federal McPhee-funded programs in Washington State. So just want to be really clear on that. So please, yes, deliver the relationship assessment tool, as Lee just mentioned, and do it on the most recent relationship that the mom may have been in. And be really transparent about that conversation and open with the mom about that as well. Okay, so let's see. We've got some more. What is we can right? certainly link to the Department of Early Learning. That's no problem at all. We will do that shortly. Thank you. Are they referring to the link to Wiscative here? Can you put the link to the section of the Dell website in this chat? Oh. I'm not sure what link you're referring to. If you could be more specific. Sherry, it was Sherry Hill. You said, can you put the link to the section of the Dell website in this chat? OK. Are there any more questions? That's the only question. So Sherry, we'll go ahead and answer that question when we get more details from you and, and provide what you're looking for. Thank okay, you. OK, thank you. All right, so some more resources. So some other resources I wanted to direct you to that's on um, Wiscative's Reproductive Justice page online because we have, as you can see, sections that apply to home visitors. So we're going to go to this right now. Jenny will help me again. And so you can see here that we have some information about um, birth control. We have a nice little poster, which you can get a hard copy of this poster from me or download a PDF of it. So you can see it's focused on birth control methods that can be used without a partner's knowledge. And risk of detection is referring to if your partner, the person who's causing harm, is tracking whether you're bleeding or not, it's important for you to tell the mom which forms of birth control interfere with her period and which ones don't. And so that information is here. So the depth of the shot, East emergency contraception, the implant, IUD. So it's limited information. It's just really focused on birth control that can be used that the partner might be less likely to know about. Whoops, what did I do? There we go. Um, more information about emergency contraception. Um, for those of you who didn't know, or maybe some people do know, that parents, we have information about teens rights in Washington State, that teens don't have, for those of you working with young moms, to know what teens don't have to share with their parents and what they do have to share. Get clear about that. Let's see. Is this right? There we go. OK. And then we have you know, just some more information about where's the cheapest place you can buy emergency contraception. Did you know that there aren't, any, there aren't restrictions any longer on it? You can be any age, any gender. And information about um, abortion services and clinics and the laws in Washington. And then we have a home visitor section, which we keep building on. And so we have one reference I wanted to refer you all to that's for the individual home visitor, that when you know domestic violence is happening, here's some questions that you can check in with yourself. You can ask at a next visit. You can think about your practice just to support you once you know domestic violence is going on. And here's one for supervisors. Well, let's see. Come on, supervisors. You gotta come up. There we go. So 
this is for supervisors here. Here are things you can explore with the individual home visitor when you know domestic violence is happening and some of the challenges that are coming up and things to check in about. These are just one-pagers to just help you um, check in with your practice and maybe your policies and procedures as well. Okay, we're going to go back to the slides now. Okay. Jenny, you want to go right ahead? We had a couple more questions. Okay, great. So it looks okay. like we're approaching noon, so oh we just want to try to get through these questions that came in. So it looks like there's one question. Are these assessment tools focused for just females? So just to repeat, the, some of the cards have um, non-gendered language in them, the safety cards that we showed at the beginning. The relationship assessment tool, it's been tested that you can use non-gendered language with it, but the Healthy Moms, Happy Babies ha has just she, mom language on it. And following up to that question, it says, I'm currently working with a man who is a victim of domestic violence. These tools seem irrelevant, and I have to admit that the use of she and her is starting to bother me. So I think that, you know, if you're looking at the relationship assessment tool, again, that's another good reason why you should memorize some of those statements and work them into the conversation because you have permission in writing. From what I understand from the Department of Early Learning and the study, it's been validated to change the language. But if you're trying to look at the perceptions of, your, of the survivor who you're working with, change the language. Don't stick the piece of paper in front of them. And then you might like the other healthy relationship card that I showed you, the brand new one with the rainbow um, coloring on it. That's all non-gendered language. If it's a man and a heterosexual relationship, again, I think the relationship assessment tool does statements and questions around trying to identify their perceptions in the relationship will still be relevant. Um, and if it's a young man, the hanging out or hooking up card is uh, totally non-gendered, that might work well. And then the last piece of information that came through, it looks like she's seeking suggestions. Um, clients living in DV now, she is requesting help because the daughter is living in DV. Okay, for the, who's requesting the help? The client. So I would, if this mom that you're working with is, uh, oh, she's requesting it for her daughter. Um, definitely you can talk to the advocacy programs and talk to the advocates in the crisis line and get help brainstorming, problem solving, figuring out what, because maybe the daughter doesn't, I'm just going to assume, maybe the daughter doesn't want to leave the relationship. So talking with an advocate about what can you do to help the daughter be safer in that relationship and maybe there's children involved, help increase the safety of the children would be helpful. Like I would use the advocacy resource to problem solve and brainstorm what next steps could be because it will probably be something that happens um, over time and the mom may have, the, the mom or the daughter may have some priorities, but the daughter may have some different priorities, but advocacy resources are there. So in the last two minutes, I'm going to quickly just show you all, here are resources here. You have a handout at the end of the webinar that says download the slides. You can see it on your control panel. You can download a PDF of these slides. Talking about abuse matters, here's one success you all have. If anyone, if you can reduce isolation or expand options, that is a success. Reducing isolation, expanding options for the folks you're working with, that is a success. You don't have to fix the whole thing and make it all perfect. Feel good knowing if you are doing those two things, you are make, helping to make change and you're helping to make families safer and you're merely talking about the abuse, you're reducing that external control or influence. This is just something I have up on my desk just to kind of remind me that the best way to support children is to support parents, that domestic violence is about coercion and power and control over another person. These nine things, I think they're just good reminders and that key at the bottom, reducing isolation and expanding options, that's a su success. We hope you can stay connected. There's ways you can stay connected to Wiscative and us. We also have a blog called Can You Relate where we're talking about healthy relationships. And there might be tools there or other kind of short graphics or things that would be useful for you. Go to Can You Relate. You can use any of the stuff there. 
We also have an annual Goodwill Refuse to Abuse walk at Safeco Field if anyone's a big baseball fan. You're welcome to come to any of our trainings. And we also have an annual conference. And don't forget, you're awesome, really. I don't think we're having evals, though. I have evals here. So there are no evaluations, but feel free. You, you know, we're always open to any of your comments in the chat box or later by email. Thank you so much for all that you do and your time. Yay, home visitors. Thank you guys all so much. We can also put contact information in the chat box to you all. So you are able to contact Lee on the information that you see on the slide. And then we'll also add our Strengthening Families email as well. So you can have two different places to be able to contact folks. So if there's any last minute comments or questions for folks that are still on the webinar that would like more information, please feel free to send those in. And Lee and I are happy to stay on for a few more minutes and answer anything that we are able to. So the last thing I referenced, I'm assuming it's, let me go back, the home visitor reference pages. And I will go back to that. So you go to um, our Wiscative page, which is just wscadb.org. That's all you need for us. And then once you're there, uh, let me just, let me drag, just drag it over. Mm -hmm. Oops, got it. Did I drag it over? Yeah. Oh, there there is. Yeah. Once you're there, you can just put in reproductive justice and this page will come up. And then just scroll down to the home visitor section and you'll see the reference sheet for home visitors and reference sheets for supervisors. And where is the handout button to access the docs? OK, so if you go to the bottom of your control panel, I think it's right at the bottom, and it says something about handouts. It's on the control panel. So if your control panel is collapsed, just click that orange document again. Orange, excuse me, orange arrow again. Should be at the bottom. But if you can't get it, Jenny can send it to you. Mm -hmm. So send Jenny an email. We're going to be putting our Strengthening Families email into the chat box. So if you are not able to access the handout, feel free to send an email to that email address, and I will be sure that you receive it. Anything else from folks? All right. Anything else? <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you all.